Hello, and welcome back to the Roguelike Celebration. Uh, I hope everyone enjoyed that break, and we have some more talks for all of you. Um, our next talk is by Julian Day. Julian is a software developer and poet from Winnipeg, Canada, and he's the author of Shadows of the Worm, a traditional roguelike. Um, but today, he's going to be talking about poetry, poetry at the end of roguelikes, writing around interactive, iterative media. And I'm really excited about it because he's going to reference one of my favorite poets, Christian Book. I have my copy of the Zeno text here, and I believe he's going to reference it. Yeah, for sure. Uh, how's this? Can everyone hear me? Yeah. Perfect. Take it away. All right. Uh, whoops. Uh, all right. So, hi. Uh, my name is Julian Day. And as Noah said, I'm a software developer living in Winnipeg, Canada, though throughout my life, I've lived kind of across the country, Vancouver, Saskatoon, Ottawa. Um, so, yeah, I'm the creator of Shadow of the Worm. It's a traditional roguelike game. And I've kind of been around the roguelike scene since the mid to late 90s. Uh, one of my friends got me into NetHack, and from there I discovered Usenet and fell in love with Adam back in the Gamma pre-release days. So, uh, this talk is about poetry, and specifically about the ways in which poetry intersects with roguelikes in different ways. So, the first part of my talk, I want to talk about how roguelikes are using poetry to create a more immersive gaming experience. Um, after that, I'm going to take a step back and look at Matthew Henderson's collection, Roguelike, uh, in which video games and roguelikes become a way through poetry of coping with intense grief. And then finally, I'm gonna take a thousand steps back and look at ways in which procedural generation has been used by experimental poet Christian Book to try to create poetry to outlast our species. So whether or not you believe the first roguelike was rogue, the early games followed a particular template you start off at the top of the dungeon and you make your way down to fulfill some kind of quest. There wasn't really a lot of room for nuance back then because the personal computers of the early 80s were just powerful enough to manage that. But once they got more capable, um, the PCs, roguelikes started to get more imaginative with the possibilities of their worlds. Uh, Omega and Alpha Man set the game outside the dungeon and Adam took that a step further, uh, adding descriptions to a monster memory to really give the game more flavor and kind of a complete set of lore. So if you've played Adam, you might have seen this map before, or maybe not at all. Um, you don't actually have to care about the Mad Minstrel to complete a regular win, but he's central to the game in a number of ways. And if you've talked to him for reasons outside of the win condition, you're sure to have seen something like this. And this is one of the Mad Minstrel's poems. Uh, Thomas Biscop uses these in interesting ways. He uses them to give information on places and people in the Dracolor chain and to hint at game mechanics. This is kind of similar to what NetHack does with the Oracle's consultations, but to do it with poetry was new and in many ways still is. In fact, Adam is still one of the few roguelikes to explicitly use poetry. In some sense, this isn't incredibly surprising. Most roguelike developers are teams of one, and most roguelike devs are typically not writers. There's kind of a sense that any writing that you have to do is you know, something that you do to get back to implementing cool mechanics and all the stuff that we like to do as developers. But every decision that we make as a developer uh, of a roguelike is a step towards building a particular world. What's the theme like? Can you talk to the NPCs? Are there graphics or plain ASCII? What does the ASCII look like? All of these things um, really impact the feel of the world that you're creating. So just as the decision to add monster memory or an item lookup creates a certain kind of world, how you describe these things and how you impart that information to the player takes it further. If this comes via in-game books with prose, you've suddenly created a world with prose. And if you do it with poetry, your world suddenly has poetry in it as well. So with that said, uh, I'm just going to talk a little bit about Shadow of the Worm. Uh, it's actually my third roguelike. Um, my first one I started in high school back in, I want to say 96, 97 in Pascal. The second one I didn't see in university, but those went nowhere, and I only ever released them to a couple of friends. The Shadow of the Worm I started back in 2011, while Adam was still in its long period of non-releasing, and it had its first release in 2015. In many ways, it became evident to me pretty quickly that I wasn't a game designer, and the game was destined to become as much of a personal Zen garden as anything else. 
I added trees that turned according to the seasons and provided fruit in summer, uh, blood alcohol levels and alcohol poisoning, so you can drink yourself to death if you want to. And in 2016, I started the rather fateful decision to write a fragment of a long poem. So taking a little step back, in late 2014, I was in the midst of a very long and difficult project at work, and I decided to, um, I was reading Edmund Spencer's Fairy Queen as a way of just, you know, helping myself sleep at night and ignore the stress. The Fairy Queen is a long poem written in a nine-line stanza of Spencer's own devising, and honestly, it's to me a bit of a slog. Uh, the language is archaic, even for the, the time, uh, and it's closer to Chaucer in some ways than Shakespeare. And honestly, for me, that meant it took a, a while to get through it. But once I did, the, the rhythms and the meter were kind of kicking around my head. And a year later, I decided to start a poem of my own. It's called Tell in Florida, and it's kind of a more modern take on the Spencerian stanza. It tells some lore about the early game world, but otherwise has no real use in game. It's purely meant as lore for people who like lore. And I'm one of those people, which is why, <laughs> why I worked on it. But before I get into that, I want to show you what the source poem or the Fairy Queen looks like. So this is a stanza from the Fairy Queen. Um, if you read it, you'll see, you know, archaic language such as wheat, which means to know. And overall, you can see that the stanza kind of reads as capital P poetry. It's more stylized or formal than what you would get with Shakespeare, who was a contemporary Spencer. But even if it's not your cup of tea, as you read it, you can kind of feel the lines which are in iambic pentameter naturally propel you forward, while the Alexandrine, or the sixth stress last line, neatly closes the whole thing off. And here's an example stanza from my long poem, in which a company of fair folk soldiers march out to take revenge for a killing. You can see that the language is entirely modern, and the feel of the poem is very different from Spencer as well. I'll get into it in a little bit, um, the techniques that I use to make it um, read a little more uh, modern. And if I read it out, it could pass as prose. The following morning, the company made their way around a set of staggered, brackish pools that buzzed with new mosquitoes and delayed their schedule. The weather never cooled, remaining humid, moisture in the air becoming condensation on the skin, beads that were formed to rivulets, and where the flat of an axe head touched the back, the thin cotton became a butterfly or violin. And here's another stanza in which two giant brothers are tricked by a sentient forest via illusions to wander deep inside where they're set upon by a nightmare creature called a banya. So this incredibly um, well done presentation here is how I'm illustrating the approach I tried to take with the poem. So almost always I stick with modern English, both in terms of uh, diction, which is word choice and style. Uh, to allow myself a greater set of rhymes, I use uh, imperfect rhymes semi-frequently. Uh, rhymes such as dread and stretched, which are based on the re sound in the middle of the word. Um, I make regular use of enjambment or breaking lines mid-sentence rather than on punctuation such as commas or periods as Spencer would have done. This allows a lot more variation in sentence length, which then helps reduce the feeling of sameness that you can feel in the, in the fairy queen. Also to allow greater variation, I don't rhyme the center lines, lines four and five, like Spencer did. So if you look in the example here, you can see that the fourth line ends with trees, the, last, uh, the fifth line ends with stretched, and there's absolutely no rhyme whatsoever. This helps create kind of a more natural feel. But like Spencer, I almost always end each stanza with the Alexandrine, uh, because it sort of neatly closes things off and propels you forward. There's uh, so far only one case in the poem where I don't do that, and I do it for a very good reason. But besides the long poem, uh, Shadow of the Worm uses poetry in a number of other ways. I've got poetic excerpts on the title screen, and there's kind of a retelling of Robin Robertson's poem at Roanhead in one of the areas in the game. But after the long poem, the most important uh, usage is probably in the game lore. Shadow of the Worm has a bestiary and an item codex, and you can use these to look up information on pretty much anything that you come across. And because I'm not content with simply describing objects clinically, I snuck in some prose poetry into a number of the item descriptions as well. Prose poetry is just poetry written in prose form. Basically, you could think of it as poetry in paragraphs. So it does away with the line breaks of traditional poetry, um, and it looks like prose, but it reads like poetry. 
I use it in the item codex in a very limited way. Um, I didn't want the whole item codex to feel like a giant, you know, block of poetic practice. Um, but I do use it for descriptions of wildflowers that you can find in the fields and villages. This has surprised a number of players who've told me how nice it is to sort of stumble across these descriptions tucked inside the mechanics of, you know, what is otherwise kind of a goblin murder simulator. So that, you know, after hitting the item codex to find out exactly what the heck a linothorax is, you might decide to look up that blue wildfire flower beside you and read, by the seaside, the small flowers lie under the hard wind and salt spray as if to say, this is enough for me, why not you? Bluebells and sea girls, cobalt crown, gullweed, saltwater daisy, false sapphire, sailor's promise, blue sky, spring clover, wild flax further in, then racing to the shore, selfie skin, oily in your hand. Using it in this limited way for the wildflowers was always intentional for me. It's kind of a cliche that poets love their flowers and trees and the moon, but I wanted Shadow of the Worm to be a world not just of monsters and magic and dungeoneering, but of poetry and art as well. And by adding these entries to the codex, as well as with my work on the long poem, I hope that I've managed to find a way to enrich, you know, its small, strange little world. Other roguelikes are going to be, you know, more streamlined, better designed, have deeper proc gen, actual graphics or sound design. But Shadow of the Worm sits in a space where the game and poetry don't just coexist, but are assen essential to each other. To me, this kind of feels like an underexplored space. And while I'm usually self-deprecating to a fault, I'm deeply proud of the work that I've been able to do there. All right, so uh, for the second part of my talk, uh, I want to talk about Matthew Henderson's collection, Roguelike. Roguelikes have been around for the better part of 40 years now and are such a niche community still that their impact on other art forms has been fairly small. But Matthew Henderson, a Canadian poet, released a collection of poems this year called Roguelike, an incredible collection about family loss, myth-making, and grief. Roguelike is, at its heart, about the poet's relationship with his uh, dead mother and her addiction to narcotics and pills during her life. It's about helplessness and grief and the things that we do and tell ourselves to cope. Henderson explores the relationship through video games, and a large portion of the collection is devoted to these poems. Gamers of a certain age will have played many of them. Diablo II, Contra, Mario Kart, Donkey Kong, Chrono Trigger, Final Fantasy. Henderson writes about tapping out the familiar sequence, up, up, down, down, and so on, trying to find something better, talking about runs and glitching, and working to figure a way through and out of his grief. And in doing so, he uses the concepts of the genre to lay out the groundwork for a myth-making, by a polymorphing through seeds and runs, and by the ultimate central feature of roguelikes, the unbreakable permanence of death. He talks about cheating the universe by wanting to glitch, turn sideways, and slip through the earth. Myth-making is really a central feature to roguelikes, maybe not the games themselves, but the community. We create stories about our best and our most unfortunate friends. We share these on, well, back in the day, Usenet, but now forums, Twitter. Uh, we post filks to news groups back in the day, or yeah, we used to. Uh, anyway, when we make myths, we repeat to ourselves the things we want to tell others. What do you think about when you think of Dwarf Fortress? For me, I think about boat murder and the lone crossbow dwarf about to die, holding out on the river. Was it true? I don't actually know, but I read about it online and it became part of the shared experience that the participants and the readers created while the save file was passed back and forth, the updates posted to Metafilter. It's become a common feature of the tale repeated over and over. It's become myth. And central to Henderson's roguelike is the idea of transformation. We see it in roguelikes all the time. The kitten kills a goblin and becomes a cat. Stone Soup's transmuter can transform itself and things around it. In Adam, you can get mutations and change yourself in a variety of ways. And polypiling is such a central strategy to NetHack that not doing it is even its own conduct. Transformation is so important to Henderson's roguelike because it permits the belief that things can change in some kind of easy, understandable way. And it allows an understanding to form through the comparison with these things. At, parts, at times in the collection, Henderson sees his mother as a kill deer, dragging her broken wing down river to protect her family, sees her soul as a hawk erupting out of the crack in her dashed skull, or sees her as a wraith, stalking his early years and hunting the rest of his life. All of it pivots around kind of a central point. 
she's gone and how to make sense of it. Throughout the collection, you can see traces of um, the discussion in permadeath. How many games of Adam have I played over the years? How many nameless characters, you know, quick, gone quickly, uh, um, forgotten the next time I start the game? I've probably played through the game thousands of times. Runs become a way of normalizing the incredible difficulty and expected failure when playing a roguelike. I've won Adam four times, my own game once, and I've never won NetHack. My failure rate is spectacular. But who cares? There's always the next run, the next roll of the dice. Maybe this time I'll get an amulet of life saving. Maybe this time Kelavaster lives. Death isn't permanent. Our lives are just bits of data and memory. What we had once, we can have again. But ultimately, runs are an escape. In life, they're a fiction. In roguelikes, we can play endlessly, talk about our win rate or plan for our next game. But all we have is the life that we make our, for ourselves and the people that we surround ourselves with or not, and what we choose to do with our precious ever dwindling time. In the title poem, Roguelike, Henderson uses Caves of Cud as the backdrop for searching for his lost mother, talking to the great saltback, traveling to Joppa and beyond, tracking her traces to the eater's glade. Roguelike is a wonderful collection in the way that it uses the concepts of the genre and of video games generally to examine love and loss, addiction and family. And at the heart of it, Henderson's message is that we have just this one life and how we live it, how we mythologize the things that happen are up to us, good and bad. All right. So for the third part of this talk, I wanna take about a thousand steps back. In the first two parts, I talked about how poetry can be used in roguelikes themselves and how roguelikes can inter interact with uh, poets' traditional uh, practices. In this last part, I want to look at how maybe the most important central mechanic in roguelikes can be used to create a poetry that outlasts us all. Generally speaking, we think of poetry as taking a couple of different forms, oral and written. Oral poetry and songs have a long history in many cultures throughout the world. In Europe, there was a, a, a long-standing tradition of telling long tales to music. And even though our records of many of these came from written records, it's thought that, for example, the Homeric epics might have been sung or chanted. And the work of the people like the Welsh bards or the continental troubadours was certainly oral as well. But more recently, with the advent of the printing press and then electronic transmission, written records have become much more durable. Since they're more easily reproduced, a good print run and wide distribution can mean that a poet's work can last long past their actual lifetime. So here I've got sort of three examples of oral poetry from roughly the same amount of time apart. Homer from ancient Greece, Cadman of Northumbria, and Blind Willie McTell from Georgia. Each one of them worked at a very different moment in time within a very different poetic tradition, but lived at a point where poetry or uh, song was expected to be heard and performed. And from similarly distant times, I've got uh, here on the left a fragment of the Epic of Gilgamesh, written in Akkadian more than a thousand years before Homer. Uh, my favorite Anglo-Saxon poem, The Wanderer, by an anonymous monk circa 10th century or so. And a twine poem, Circuits, released in 2018. Perhaps one of the greatest problems with art is how precarious it is. Uh, genocide, both physical and cultural, can wipe out a people's history and records, whether oral or written. As a species, humans tend toward violence. The lists of acts that intentionally destroy priceless works of literature and art is as long as it is tragic. In the last, say, 120 years, we've seen the destruction of Liban by the Germans, uh, ISIS and Taliban destruction in Syria, Iraq, and Afghanistan. And we've also seen cultural genocide practiced by the Canadian and American governments in the residential school systems. And these are just a few examples. Sometimes the damage is temporary, but more often it's permanent. So uh, just to move a bit further into the Xenotext. So Christian Book is a Canadian experimental poet and his Xenotext project is an attempt to create an encoded and durable um, poem that can outlive humanity. The way Book looks to do this is by a procedural generation. We're all familiar with it as the way roguelikes create variants. 
um, generating interesting landscapes, new items and monsters, and otherwise creating algorithmic novelty. Each roguelike has its own take on ProcGen in terms of how it's used, uh, where and how much, and Book harnesses it in a very biological way, looking to use the basic mechanisms of bacteria to encode one poem and generate another over and over and over. To do this, uh, Book first worked with the E. coli bacterium because it was cheap to use in a laboratory setting. But ultimately, he had his eye on a different bacterium, Dinococcus radiodurans, which is a special bacterium that can survive just about anything. It can survive extreme cold, acid, dehydration, and incredible doses of radiation. So to create a poem that could potentially outlast humanity, this seemed like the perfect fit. So Book set about trying to find a cipher to make this procedural generation po possible. He did this by way of a, a sub. His approach was to use a substitution cipher. So you're probably familiar with these in terms of like newspaper puzzles and the like, where you start off with gobbledygook and through the substitution cipher, you get say um, uh, um, a meaningful phrase. Essentially a substitution cipher is a mapping from one set of letters to another where the letter A in the original might correspond to Z in the decoded version. Now this particular cipher may or may not work. If you look at the example I have on this slide, it is essentially meaningless. However, if you find a different mapping, then you can see that we've got meaningful text on both sides. And this is Book's aim, to create a meaningful source poem himself that decodes to a second, also meaningful poem. And to be able to do this, he has to have a cipher. To find a suitable cipher, Book created a Python program that would help generate uh, potential candidates. The details here in the, all the articles I found online are a little scarce, but I've kind of assumed that part of what the program does is create a list of co-meaningful words or words that decode to other words instead of gibberish when decoded. So as an example, in one of his candidate ciphers, the letter A becomes the letter I when you go from the source to the destination. And this is good. It lets you use indefinite articles in the source poem and the personal pronoun in, this, in the uh, destination. Uh, you get examples where, say, abased equals iciest, and other word pairs emerge. So at some point, Book selects one of these and then set about writing the source poem. And this is part of the source poem that Book created himself. And then this is the start of the output poem, which will be generated by the bacterium. But so far, all we have is a cipher and a carefully constructed pair of poems. So how do we get from the source to the destination uh, using the bacteria? So Book does this by mapping each letter of the source alphabet to a biological codon. Each codon in DNA represents an amino acid. And through heavy simulation on a supercomputer, uh, Book and the, um, the teams that he worked with, um, they were able to find a viable gene to work with. So the gene was then sequenced and inserted into the bacterium. And then the bacterium takes over. It acts on the gene and via RNA transcription uh, creates a new gene. From there, we can extract the output poem, Eurydice. And then when examining the sequence of codons, they should spell out after decryption using the cipher, the full text of Eurydice. So results. Christian Book's actually been working on this program for a project for many years. He started it in 2002, and through various grants, he spent more than $100,000 on the project. The Xenotex is the sort of obsessive lifelong project that can consume someone. Book is, in terms of, like, say, number of collections, not overly prolific. Apart from the Xenotext Book One, which is a traditional book providing the kind of context and motivation in poetic form, which he published about five years ago, he's only actually published a couple of other collections in the last 26 years. And the good news is he's had some success. The process worked as expected in E. coli, causing the bacteria to glow red and allowing the team to decode the text of Eurydice. But D radio Durans has not, as far as I've been able to find on the web, been fully successful. It moves quickly and it takes apart Book's work. He's joked that he's created the first bacterial critic, but what he's really found is proof that nature is resistant to our novel and clever ideas. 
ultimately the $120,000 question, the amount of funding the project has received over the last uh, 18 years is whether the book can be fully successful. For all the talk about eternal poetry, Eurydice is not lasting long enough to be detected in its full form in the lab environment in the, uh, the target bacteria. But even if he can get D. radiodurans to stop undoing his work in the lab, how would it fare in an actual ecosystem? How could he stop evolution and cause the genes to remain eternally unchanged, unbowed against selection pressure in every conceivable situation? But for all the pro problems around written records, we have found a way to outlast ourselves. When the Voyager spacecraft set out in the 70s with its golden record, it left with an encoded format of its own. And now into deep space, it seems all but certain that it will continue its journey past the stars and planets long after we as a species are dead and done. So maybe the problem isn't with traditional inscription as such, whether on vellum or clay or stone. Maybe you just have to take us out of the equation. So here I've got a few uh, references. If you're interested, I can email them to you. Uh, otherwise, um, just wanted to provide some links and credits for the reading, things like that. Uh, I've got a link to my review of Henderson's Roguelike in the Thames Review if you're interested. And otherwise, I think we have four minutes for Q&A. Wonderful. That was great. Um, yeah, it's fascinating. I had heard, I mean, I've, I have Xenotext, I've read it. Uh, it's incredible. I love the book. Yeah, and I saw Christian do a recitation of it, but he is really like tight lipped with sort of like where he is in that progress and it's mm -hmm. really shrouded in mystery. I could not for the life of me find um, like an honest like 2020, what's the status of this project? It seems to be announced kind of in fits and spurts. So I, yeah, I just don't know. I know, I just know that they were successful with E. coli, but E. coli doesn't, it isn't as durable as radiodurance. Yeah, it's super cool. Um, let's see what questions we have. Uh, it just looks like we have one question currently. Someone wants you to recite the description of the mansion's chef. The mansion's chef. Uh, let me just pull that up here. <laughs> Other people are saying, that they feel totally overwhelmed by your presentation. <laughs> Whoops. Was I, that it was I speaking too fast? Broke in their brain. No, I think like conceptually things like embedding uh, poetry into, you know, a bacteria is, is a That's, lot to really wrap your mind around. It's kind of crazy. I remember coming across that the first time years ago and being like, what the hell is he doing? Like, you know, just writing uh, Unoya wasn't enough for him. Like, you know, this is like next level stuff. Uh, so am I just going to recite the the cook's description, or? Uh, sure. All right. Uh, an important position in any noble's household is that of the cook. For actually cooking one's own meals is the sort of thing that filthy peasants do. A well-bred noble will have someone to cook their own food for them, freeing time for important tasks, like running down foxes on horseback and watching the dogs tear them apart. Drinking powdered dragon teeth is a as a purported penile enhancer, or on rainy days, simply oppressing the plebs. It falls on the cook to make the daily meals for an often considerable household, and that so many do so without outright poisoning their employers must be considered one of the ongoing mysteries of the world. Cool. Uh, we have another question here. Um, someone wants to know, in general, what kinds of constraints in poetry do you find work well in sort of the procedural space? So I know there's there's probably a lot more to the procedural space that people are doing that I'm not aware of. I work, went with a very kind of constrained um, uh, sort of presentation. One of the ones I really like is um, uh, working with like, for example, cut up poetry, where you can take source poems, cut them into pieces, and then, you know, um, like reassemble them in, in various ways, um, like, you know, using either, you know, just your own creativity or using algorithms, things like that, and getting kind of interesting um, new poems that way. That's something I've played around with a little bit and I want to do more in the future. Cool. Um, maybe we have time for one more question. Um, 
Oh yeah, what is the weirdest kind of other information store that you found during your research, I guess in reference to Christian Book's method of encoding in bacteria? Um, the one that I really like are there's, um, I want to say like 8th or 9th century China, um, there's incredibly important poetry written out on these gigantic like, um, like stone bells almost, and they're an incredibly important Chinese cultural artifact and um, I remember looking, reading that and being like, yeah, of course it makes sense to store poetry on, you know, stone. Like, how else are you going to, you know, make it last for thousands and thousands of years? That was one of my favorite ones that I came across. Hmm. That sounds super cool. I think I may have even seen those. Um, well, thank you so much. Uh, hopefully you'll stick around the social space and chat with people. Yeah, uh, I'll be in the like chat. There's a lot of excitement about your talk. Cool. All right. Thanks a lot.